setting goals and hitting goals. This seems to be part of the formula of success in fitness. But here's what a lot of people don't tell you. Hitting your goals can be depressing. It's true. There's something called a rival fallacy. Maybe you've experienced it yourself. You dream about hitting a goal. You work hard towards that goal. You finally hit that goal and then the come down and it's quite hard. Today's episode, we're talking all about how to avoid that and uh, how to enjoy the process. I, uh, do you guys ever, ever experience this with clients? Oh yeah. 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 This was, this was, this was uh, a common one. Yeah. I, I used to, you know, I didn't realize what it was at first, but I would see clients that would like, more commonly you would see this, um, with clients where they would sign up for like a race. Mm -hmm. Uh, so people are like, Oh, you know, I'm, I don't work out now at all, or I'm I'm not fit, but I'm going to sign up for this marathon. I want you to help, you know, train me on top of it. And they'd work hard and they'd be consistent and they'd be real motivated. Then they'd do the marathon. And then it was like, it got to the point where I, if somebody told me they were going to hire me to do a race mm -hmm. and they weren't like, this wasn't what they always did that I would talk them out of it. Cause so I was like, no, you are going to stop afterwards. It was like clockwork that these people would, would train for this marathon or this race or whatever, get to that point and then lose all desire, motivation, enjoyment out of what they were doing. Stop. Yeah. And totally stop. Um, and then, you know, of course I've experienced it myself. Well, yeah. And as they're going through it, a lot of it was like, they were doing it in spite of what they enjoy. So it was like, not, it, it definitely, the process for them was all discipline and it yeah. was just like, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. And then they get there. Uh, they don't want to repeat a lot of the process that got them there because that was like not enjoyable for them. And so it's like, where do I go from here? And so that was kind of a hard conversation to have afterwards. What do you think it is? Do you think it's the, the buildup? Like they have built it up in their head to be something greater. Like, oh, when I get there, yeah. it's all this is how it's. I'm gonna, I'm gonna feel like a different person. Yeah. I'm gonna have all these things, mm -hmm. and then you get there, and then it's just like, oh, it's not. Yeah, it's it's. There's, there's a term for it. I, I said it. It's a rival fallacy. Are they all the same? Is that work? Like, so the rival fallacy is is with. It could be for a lot of things. Yes, right? it can. I mean, you ever ever had this? I mean, I remember. Um, like, if I just make this much money. I'll be happy. Or if I just get that car, I'll be happy. Or if I just, you know, even, even if you ever had, you ever, did you guys ever have like a crush on like a, like a girl when you were younger <laughs> and like you, like you wanted her for like the longest time. And then like years later, maybe you guys got together with that. And then it just, just yeah, never yeah. lived. Her up personality to sucks. Yeah. Like, don't ah. know. You were just, you, you were so, you, you were so much uh, like into the, uh, getting to the place where that could be a possibility. And so you thought about it for so long. And then when it finally arrives, it's just like, Oh, yeah. it's not what yeah, I they call it, it uh, post achievement depression or postpartum depression uh in, you know, in relation to achievement a rival fallacy like we just said remember mark manson he was on the show he's yes. the author of um the subtle art of not giving a f right mm -hmm. he wrote that book and he talked about how his dream had always been to be a best-selling author and then when he finally accomplished it he went through the hardest depression of his entire life and he talked about this as well and he's like mm -hmm. and, and when you read about this what it is. And this is why people get caught in a trap, right? Where they set a goal. This is the goal I'm going to hit. And then they hit the goal. And, and again, if you look at the data on like weight loss, for example, a significant percentage of people, it's not a majority, but a significant percentage, something like 30% of people who set a wet, weight loss goal actually hit it. Mm -hmm. It's a big number when you should, we consider how many millions of Americans try to lose weight. But then of that, whatever, whatever the number was, 25, 35%, almost all of them get the weight back. Almost every single person gains the weight back within a year or two. Um, and they experience this feeling. And, and when you read about it, um, psychologically, what happens is we paint this picture. It's this, uh, this happiness, um, you know, myth where, oh my God, if I lost 30 pounds, I'm going to feel like this and everything's gonna be amazing. And life's gonna be so much better. And so much, it's everything. Or if I just hit that milestone in, in money mm -hmm. that I need to make, or if I could just do that, you know, deadlift or whatever, everything's gonna be so amazing. And you're, but you're always let down. You're always let down because there's the things that really make you happy in life are not those. Uh, in fact, when we get, you know, obviously we're going to talk about fitness. What you end up realizing is the, the, the 30 pound weight loss isn't what made is going to make you happy. It's all the stuff you do. If you do it right to lose the 30 pounds, that makes you happy. Well, Today's YouTube giveaway is maps powerlift. If you want to win that, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Trainers and coaches, the Mind Pump Trainer course is out now because it's a brand new launch. Here's what you get with it for free. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, Lead Generation Masterclass, 11 Maps Mods, free, 13 Maps Guides, free, $200 off, and access to our private Facebook group. 
If you're interested, go to mindpumpfitnesscoaching.com. Use the code 200 off for that discount. Also, we have a sale on some workout program bundles. We have the new to weightlifting bundle, the body transformation bundle, the new year extreme intensity bundle, and the body transformation bundle 2.0. All of those also are on sale. Just check them out at mapsjanuary.com. All right, here comes the show. Well, it's not exactly the same, but I know a lot of athletes that I've talked to and me personally even have gone through that sort of transition phase where it's like you identify so much yeah. with this one track. Like I'm, I, my identity is me trying to get to the ultimate uh, championship game or like, you know, achieve this kind of success uh, in, in elongate my career. Once my career is over or if it's cut short, what do I do now? I have like this, this period of depression where it's like, I have to reinvent myself. I have to like, uh, think about other things to, to get involved with, uh, and, and to then identify in that direction. And it's like, it, it, I feel like the, the same thing kind of happens when uh, a lot of the clients I've had that have achieve some of those like weight loss goals or some of those, um, maybe they competed on stage or maybe they did some of these events and, and they sort of, well, that was like my entire focus and I identify as this person, but now, now what, where, what do I do? Do you yeah. think it's possible that we reach somebody who's in that and, and convince them otherwise? Like, I don't know if it's like, I think back to, and I think the thing that I can relate to the most with this was, the. Uh, the financial one, right? Yeah. Like I had built that up in my, since I was a kid. Right. So that was like a, wasn't like I thought about it for a year or two. I thought about it for decades, like to, Oh, when I get to this place, you know, financially, like I'm just going to be so happy or whatever like that. And then you reach that and it's just like, Oh, I'm actually unhappy right now. This is weird. Right. But I don't think there's anything. I don't even know if me could go back in time and talk to me and convince me Otherwise, in fact, I think I remember people telling me when I was like, in, in, like in my attitude was like, yeah, well, I'll, I'll solve that problem. When <laughs> I get, I'll get there. Just like, like people we tell uh -huh. when they, when that's what I'm saying. Like, so uh, yeah. do you, is it possible? Like when you, when you become, because hitting big goals, whether it be a big lofty financial goal or, or a big lofty physical fitness goal, those are, those are big goals. They're hard. They're hard to achieve. Right. I mean, there's more, more millionaires than there are people with six pack abs. Right. right? right. So it's, it's no joke to try and do that. And in order to get to a place where you can even achieve that, uh, the, the level of mindset that you need to have, is it breakable? Is it, mm. is it potentially, can I, you, can you get to it? I, and, I think yeah. it is if it's communicated, right? Like, because you need goals. Uh, otherwise you don't know what you're aiming for. So I think someone listening in that case may be arguing and be like, what are you talking about? I need to have a goal. This is what drives me. This is my, so it's not that you, that goals are bad. It's, uh, idolizing them and falling in love with them. Yeah, That's I think. The problem. Yeah, I think the key to this conversation is not to to deter somebody from having these these lofty goals, right. but better yet, help them yeah. set the expectation. Right, like that's that's where I think I, I I failed was that when I got to that place, had somebody maybe communicated like, oh yeah, no, it's there's a lot of amazing things that you're going to have when you get to this level. It's going to open all these great doors for you. One thing that will almost inevitably happen though is like your expectations will be off. Like mm -hmm. your expectations of how you think you're going to feel uh, won't be what you think they are, and this is the fallacy. Well, that'll bring us. So that, that's going to kind of illustrate the first thing to focus on. Um, so I'll ask you this, Adam, because you, you you know you just brought up how you had a financial goal. Looking back, you remember that hitting that goal wasn't what you thought it was, right? Right. But looking back at that whole era or time, I could probably guarantee that you have very fond memories of the way towards that goal, the, grind. Like the process. Yeah. Like if you look back, it wasn't hitting that goal where you look back and go, that was awesome. It was like, oh man, actually it was awesome. When I figured this out, I had to grind this. I had to do, develop this. I had to go through that challenge. It, it was all that stuff that you probably look back and, and. Oh, a hundred percent. And the thing, the thing that I probably value the most, and I've, I've talked about this too. This is why we've, we've talked about this before with like, if you know, if everybody could buy a pill, and then you just be this the physique you wanted. We'd be miserable and unhappy because yeah. the part that the best part about it is the figuring out process, the right? The process, and that same thing goes for the financial journey too. It's like um, this is why I think we see those examples of people that have the windfall of money or inheritance. Why they end up blowing or what that is because there's behaviors that are built along the way that are probably the most valuable part of mm -hmm. the. So the most valuable part of achieving that level of money is also the part of blowing some of it, losing some of it, making some bad decisions along the way. Oh, correcting. Oh, creating better habits and having better financial hygiene. Like, so there's these things that 
that is the most valuable part because that's the part that's now carried to this this other this next you know season of my life. I have so now you don't repeat those mistakes, that's right? Yeah. And that's the I think that's a, a main point for me. It's like you got to go through those struggles, each part of that, each level of that journey, uh, and really acknowledge a lot of these things that you've overcome and troubleshot, you know, past. So that way, too, like this is this is a level now that not you're not just going to achieve it, but you're going to be able to maintain it and, and be able to then you know progress from there. Right. Yeah. The process of getting to a goal is a lot of dopamine, right? And dopamine is a, is a driver. It doesn't. It's not a, a achiever. It's not like got there. It's a get there, get there, get there. So once you're there. You get like a dopamine withdrawal, like what, you know, that's what they're saying is happening on a, you know, kind of neurological uh, level. I had, I experienced this in a short period of time. I've experienced this many times, but I remember one example is I, I, this was years ago when my wife and I were kind of first started dating. She was big into hiking. Now I thought I liked hiking because she asked me, do you like hiking? I said, yeah. Now for me, hiking was like on a nice trail through yeah. the woods or whatever, right. but she did like Hiking, like the kind where there's like not yeah, really like a, a backpack. Oh yeah, where you're like it's like people die, right? It's like there's this really dangerous, you know, kind of stuff. But because I just started dating her, I don't want to, you know, I want to kind of impress her or whatever. I said, yeah, I like hiking too. Let's do it. So we were in Kauai, <laughs> and there's a trail called the Kalalau Trail, which I know you've done that too, yep. right? Yeah. Uh -huh. In fact, they tell you there the the native the people who live there say don't do the trail if you don't live here because it's, it's, it can be pretty bad. Like you have to hike in, you camp out. It's gnarly. It's gnarly. But so we get there and of course she's all like well-versed in hiking. I have no idea what I'm getting into. So I'm like, let's, let's do this trail. So anyway, we do this crazy trail and it was definitely treacherous, definitely out of my comfort zone. At one point we're walking through water, holding her equipment up and you know, the cliff is on the other side on some parts and it's, it was pretty, it was pretty gnarly for someone like me. But I remember we got to this one part and it was this beautiful view. It was this incredible view. Now the view was gorgeous, but had you flown me in on a helicopter and I landed and got out and looked at the view, not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. And when I think back at that whole process, I don't think about the view. I think about getting there. That was the whole, uh, that was where all the value was. And the same is true for, for fitness. So hitting, having goals is great, but the key is to try to fall. So don't fall in love with the goal. A goal is a, something is a target. But don't fall in love with the goal. Don't fantasize about the goal. Like everything's gonna be so amazing when I get there because it's not. It's not. It's gonna totally. It's gonna be under what you believe it to be in terms of expectations. Really, what you need to do is focus on falling in love on the with the process, the day to day process. Like, man, I woke up today and I didn't want to work out, but I did. And oh, I did that workout and I didn't feel good, but then my shoulder felt better. And it was good. Oh, I hit a PR tomorrow, you know, yesterday, and so today I'm gonna do this and. When you fall in love with the process, uh, what happens is you'll always follow the process. And then the goals are milestones along the way, like signs along the trail of a hiking trail. There is no end goal. There's just, here's mile one, here's mile two. But I'm going to keep going because I love following the process. Once you do that, then the goals hit themselves. And you don't get that post-achievement depression because – there is no achievement, right? It's all about the process. And that's that that means you have to focus on it though. Now, how do you do that? That's the real question. And mm -hmm. I think the key to that is a, attaching it to other things than just like the main goal, which the main goal many times is, oh, I want to lose 30 pounds or, oh, I want to look a certain way. But in order to fall in love with the process, I think you have to find ways that you attach these small wins or small behavioral changes, how they impact your life in other ways mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't, you like I talked recently on the podcast mm -hmm. about how I was sharing with you guys. I you had one of these moments again, where I, I realized like, man, it's so crazy. What a different husband and dad I am when I just get exercise and movement yeah. in the day. It's like, I didn't make any, that, that exercise and movement that day that I was speaking of, I definitely didn't make any huge strides towards my getting jacked goal or losing body fat percentage goal or mm -hmm. getting stronger goals, like barely anything, but just getting in there moving and doing a few movements played such a huge role in like how I showed up as a dad and as a husband that, that afternoon or that evening at home. And so the way that I, I I focus on the process is when I have these little behavioral things like that that are leading towards this big goal, I look for other things that I can attach it to in life other than that that's attached yeah. to the goal. Yeah. Like it's like, oh, that's why I do that. And if you can do that, you can you can focus, I feel like, on the process. Yeah, each each uh, good decision you make has like a, a a compounding effect. And so you have to like look at and see how that sort of affects things uh, further on. And, you know, me making a good um, 
choice nutritionally. Like, uh, you know, it's going to give me a little bit more energy. It's going to give me a little bit better sleep. I'm, I'm always like constantly evaluating that if I'm more productive because I'm more active, you know, I have more energy. Like you just start attaching it to all these other traits that, um, you know, definitely you could see it if you're looking for it. Yeah. I mean, which is kind of the second part, which is to, to, to like really be present. Like if you think of a great artist, the, a great artist uh, isn't doesn't fall in love with the the painting that they finish the masterpiece they don't look at it and go wow that's I'm it, it's the painting that they're in love with they're in love with the creating it's the happy it, trees it's is <laughs> it's a, a musician same thing the musician loves creating right the the creator the person who's you know the person who who works out consistently the goals are great and they reflect the hard work and the dedication. But they're so present in what they're doing that they just enjoy the process. Like I look, I've worked out when I felt great, when I felt bad, when it was to relieve stress, when I was in pain, when I felt you know when I was hitting PRs, whatever. The process itself, I enjoy so much. I don't think I'll ever stop, regardless of what you know lies ahead. I think I'm just going to do it because I enjoy the process. And that's there's this old I don't know if it's Japanese. I want to say Japanese uh, practice. Maybe Doug will know where they. They they do these these really intricate designs in sand, and there's these huge sand gardens where they do these. They, they like pass these rakes over. I think it is. I don't know if is it Japanese, Doug. Am I tripping? I'm not sure. Okay, they make these incredibly intricate designs, mm -hmm. and then you when they get to, them and everything, yeah, yeah, and when they get to the very and it's literally a practice. Yeah. It, and I don't. I think it's a. I want to say it's maybe tied to Buddhism, but they make mm -hmm. these intricate designs, and when they get to the very end, they wipe it clean and yep. start all over. Yeah, they never leave it to look it's a at form it. Form of meditation. Yeah, it's Tibet. Tibet. Okay. It's all about it's, and it really is an incredible practice of, of being present and, uh, you know, if, if falling in love with the process or the journey. Yeah. And so when you're working out, if you're thinking about, I'm doing this so that I can, I'm doing this so that, and wow. you're living in the future, I'm doing this so I can look like this, so I can feel like this, so I can lift this much weight. You're not living right now. You're living in the future. Think about your job, right? Think about your job. If, if your job is just so I can get to the end of the day, so I can go home, so I can save up enough money to retire, eventually you get to retirement and then you'll get that post-achievement depression, which is real, by the way. People achieve this, get to get this in retirement. But imagine if the you working, what you did, you just learned to enjoy. You just love that process. Well, you'll never want to stop, even if you had enough money to retire. And, and that requires you being present in the moment. I, I've caught myself doing this many times where I get to a certain point and then I look back and I go, man, I totally, uh, like, I, I should have been more present. Like, I missed that whole period, which was actually kind of awesome now that I think about it. Yeah. But I was so focused on what I, where I am now that, you know, it's, and luckily, you know, you, you know, just more personal, what we do here, um, you know, God, when we started, we were in Doug's living room. To the whole, now, mm -hmm. thankfully, I think we were all old enough at that time, mature enough to remind ourselves to be present. But even then, I look back and I go, man, that was a good time. We had no money. We weren't making any money, I should say. The business was whatever, but it was a great time. It's know? hard when you're driven and, and it's, you know, you get caught up future tripping, as I've heard it yeah. uh, expressed. But um, yeah, when you're when you're able to to slow down, really like pay attention and be present with what's in front of you, I, f I feel like there's a study out there in terms of like the happiest people are the ones yes. that are most present like on a day-to-day -day basis and you see this also as an example of like flow state with athletes or flow state uh it you know in general uh once you achieve that flow so you can't achieve flow state if you're not like hyper present in that moment yeah. what what are okay so in taking that in uh relation to exercise and training and going to the gym what does that look like or what does it not look like so does that mean like when i go to the gym if my goal is being ultimate, ultimately present in the moment and not fixated yeah. on my future goal or distracted about the fight I just had with my wife or thinking about, oh my God, this bill I got to pay. So what, is that, what does that look like putting that into Here's practice? Here's what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like you're off in your mind somewhere else just trying to get through it, okay? Because you'll see this with people working out where they're just like, ah, I got to get through it. One of the reasons why I like strength training so much is it's the, one of the harder forms of exercise to not be present. Like you can, you can not be present on a treadmill or a bike. You could do it with weights too. You just do circuits over and over again and your form is out the window type of deal. But if you're to be present, you're in the exercise, in the movement, feeling the muscle, feeling what's going on. You are there. Heavy weights helps with this because if you're not present, you'll hurt yourself or you'll drop. It's away. hard to think about taxes when you're bench pressing. Yeah, you're there, right? <laughs> So that is being present. Another thing is, uh, in, in smartphones have really messed up the how present people can be in their yeah. workouts. Because in between sets, 
they're on their phones and they're not in their bodies at that moment. Yeah. You know, during the set they are, but then they're out of it. So I, you know, one I'm, thing, gu I'm guilty of that. That's totally. Something that, that's something yeah. that I have to be mindful of is that because you can, right. We can easily get caught up in like scrolling or emailing or doing something else. And I know the value of being hyper present when I, when I work out, I was watching, uh, I've talked about, I talked about this a long time ago, but I was watching, uh, pumping iron. It's a documentary, uh, in the seventies, Arnold Schwarzenegger. How many and times I, do you think you've watched? I, at least a hundred. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm curious. And each time I watch it, I notice new little details. And one thing that I noticed was that because uh, a lot of scenes, obviously, they're working out, talking, whatever. And I noticed like there's no music in the background of the gym. Mm. Now, now music wasn't introduced until a little later, but the original gyms, like you went in, nobody was playing music. Nobody had headphones on because Walkman were not really a thing then, or if they were, nobody really used them in the gyms. It was like clanging weights, yeah. grunting, grunting yeah. and people, uh, yeah. yeah, like they were all like there. One more. Yeah. <laughs> they were all very you present. You got it. So I practiced some of this because music can do that too, but music can also make you present. So I've done this now where I, I, my phone, I make a rule. I won't take it out of my pocket. It's in my pocket. And I've done it also where I don't listen to music. So I'm just there, just with my body. And it does change it. The other thing too is I used to do this with clients is I would have them, uh, when they would write like sets and reps and what they were doing, is I told them to bring it uh, right on paper yeah. instead of the phone so they weren't so distracted. Yeah. But it's literally being in your body, feeling what you're feeling and being very present. Um, yoga, traditional yoga can do this very well. And they teach you this on how to do that. And um, it forces you to kind of be there with yourself. But uh, that's what it looks like. Same thing with food. Like if you're eating a meal that you're like, I have to eat this so that I can lose weight, you're probably like trying to do like just dis like uh, distract yourself or not think about it. But what you can actually do is you can actually build good relationship with it by savoring it, focusing on it. What am I eating? What this is doing for me? And oh, I feel good. And then you start to develop a good relationship where you actually start to want to eat those things and you actually start to enjoy eating healthy food. But that's what being present, right? I'm not on my phone, not watching something, not reading something. I'm here right now during the process. And, uh, that is a great way to prevent that whole, like, otherwise what happens is all you're thinking about is where you're going. Like, oh, I'm doing this long walk, but I'm just thinking about the fact that I'm going to get to that place rather than the walk itself. I, I also like the advice that we give about treating workout as like a practice. And I think that, that coming in with that mindset, because I think so many people have this mindset of, I have to come in and crush it. Like mm -hmm. I have to break yeah. this major sweat or I got to be almost ready to vomit or it's not a good workout versus going in and saying, hey, I'm going to go in and practice these movements and then almost like allowing the workout to come to you. Right. Like I, did, I, my, my, I trained yesterday and it was like that. Like I was just not in the mood. I was in, in watching football and stuff like that. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, there's a couple of movements I'm going to do in the garage. I'm just going to practice the movement. And I was, I, Katrina was working out. So I'm like, I'm just going to use her weight. And I'm just going to move the, move the bar and stuff like that. But after a, a few rounds of doing that, like then I started to feel really good. And then I started to stack on the weight. And it's like, I didn't go in telling myself I had to do that. I went in and saying, I'm just going to practice these movements, yeah. mm -hmm. allow the workout to come to me. And it's like, oh, now that I'm in this groove, I'm feeling good. Now I'll start to, and then it ended up being this great workout. You know? That's yeah, awesome. So much stress and relief you can have with that mindset going in. Cause I've had so many uh, workouts like that that you're just like not really feeling it or whatever but you just start moving and just let the workout kind of sometimes it's it just is like wow you have all this energy and then you pr and you're yeah. like wow i didn't expect that oh yeah which is the best yeah okay so the next one is this is what the data shows by the way there's a lot of data on this now in fact harvard had a 75 year long study that was done on what makes people actually happy like what really moves the needle so my very good friend arthur brooks he's a a professor at Harvard, and he's an expert. He's one of the foremost experts on happiness. And I remember he explained this to me um, in regards to beauty, how people chase beauty thinking, you know, we'll talk here in terms of aesthetics. I get the body I want. People think that that's going to make them so happy. And he goes, Sal, he goes, let's say you're a six on a scale of one to 10 in terms of beauty. And you spend all your money, time, and energy going from a six to a nine. So now you're a nine on a scale of one to 10. He goes, your happiness on the happiness meter will barely move because it barely moves at all. It's almost doesn't register how non-important it is. And, and a lot of people don't know this. They think what'll make them happy is money and fame and beauty. But the reality, the data is very clear on this. Very clear. Uh, like it's not your good health makes you happy. The looks don't. So the reason why fit people tend to be happy isn't because they look so good is because they're healthy and fit. So it's the, it's the causation is the other way around. So it's yeah. the, it's the fact that they're healthy and fit. Um, spiritual practices 
give people a lot of happiness. Connection with other people make people very happy. Having a sense of purpose will make you happy. You know, Arthur Brooks said that. He goes, if you have a job where you're you're doing the job and you feel a deep sense of purpose, like I'm doing this and, the, and what I'm doing is good and what I'm doing matters and it's important to me, then it'll bring you happiness. If what you're doing doesn't do that, and even if you, even if you make $10 million, he says, don't place your eggs in that basket because it's not going to bring you that kind of happiness. Uh, I said connection earlier. That's a big one. People, the people around you. When you look at the happiest people uh, in terms of joy and not suffering from depression, anxiety, um, they almost all have these nice yeah. social networks and closeness. Big communities. Yeah, with, with people Wasn't that one of the things that they connected the blue zones too? Was that yeah. the, almost mm -hmm. all the blue zones have some sort of like connection community yep. like that? Yep. Same There's thing. also Arthur Brooks. I don't know how he says that. He says that he's got a really great way of saying this, but he said, I don't know exactly what he says, but it's not about getting more like in terms of like material things. It's about learning to want less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big one. And, and when he, I remember the first time I heard that I couldn't help but think of my parents and my grandparents because they grew up so poor and my dad telling me how, he was confused at how unhappy people were. No, he wasn't confused. He said, it's funny how unhappy people are today. He goes, when I was a kid, he goes, I didn't have toys. We, he said, I barely had clothes. I couldn't yeah. afford anything. Yeah. But we played together all the time, and the families were always together. He goes, we didn't have our own bedrooms. He goes, I shared a bed with my you know five siblings. He goes, and now we got these big houses because everybody's alone in their own rooms, and everybody's got their video games or whatever, and people are unhappy. He goes, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was missing, but I don't think I was missing much. You know, it's just wanting less. That's a big one. A yeah, really isn't, big isn't there, uh, I don't know if I've heard Arthur Brooks talk about, but isn't there something also connected to just giving, which is kind of tied yeah. to that? Like when you get into a place of wanting less or needing less, and then you actually are in a position where you can give to others, like the, how much more rewarding that is than actually achieving or getting yourself. Oh, mm -hmm. the, it's, it's incredible. Which brings us to, to the last one, which is to practice gratitude. So what does that look like with fitness? Well, um, you know, instead of thinking that, okay, uh, in 12 weeks, I'm going to be 15 pounds lighter, let's say, or whatever, you're thinking to yourself like, man, I'm, I was able to work out today and how grateful I am that I'm in here in this gym or I'm outside, I'm doing this exercise or I'm moving or wow, um, my knee pain is a little bit better or, you know, for three days now I haven't eaten any dessert, you know, and I'm, I'm really grateful. And in fact, I feel good. I'm grateful for how I feel or you know, I've been feeling bad, but I'm grateful that I'm here type of deal. That, what was that? You, you brought up a, a About quote. anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the yeah. anxiety and, 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 and gratitude and occupy the same part of the brain. The same yeah. part of the brain. So it's same impossible pathway. to be focused on both of them simultaneously. Therefore, if you are in a place where you are anxious a lot or you have a lot of anxiety, one of the most powerful things that you can do is simply just do a gratitude practice because just by you shifting over there will uh, at least temporarily eliminate that anxiety because they can't both occupy mm -hmm. the brain at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so such a powerful, t which is why too, I think that, you know, almost every self-help book or every, mm -hmm. you know, you know, billionaires morning routine, but they all have a, a practice of gratitude in there for that simple reason that I think that everybody has some sort of level of anxiousness or anxiety mm -hmm. that if they don't have it all the time, then that it definitely crosses their life sometimes. And the power of learning to have a gratitude practice is a simple way to shift you out of that, you know, in yeah. the moment. And, and it's exponential, you yes. know, the, the bigger you grow and the more responsibilities you have. And so to, to implement a good, Gratitude practice, it helps to kind of neutralize that quite a bit. Yeah. By the way, it's called a practice. I remember, I don't know, who's, who told me this? It was a friend of mine. And they said, it's a practice because you have to practice. It doesn't come naturally. And that's, you know, blew me away. And basically our brains, I mean, we're, we're the result of, of evolution. And, you know, you, we survived if we focused on the negative, right? If we focused on what was scary, what we, oh, we're, we're, don't go over there. Watch out over there. Did you hear what happened to Bob yesterday? He got eaten by a lion or whatever. Our brains are, are, are wired to do that because it keeps us alive and that passes our genes on. Gratitude is not necessarily a natural thing. You have to practice it and develop it as a skill. So when people say practice gratitude, I know how I used to feel. I used to feel like it was almost condescending. Where mm -hmm. like people were like, well, practice gratitude. Well, yeah, I know I'm lucky for this. And I know there's people on the other side of the world that can't do this. And yeah, I know I need to lose weight, but at least I have you know, mobility in my lower body and I can move or whatever, but that doesn't make me feel any better type of deal. It's like, no, no, that's not what it means. What it means is you have to literally sit down and consciously 
practice gratitude. And then what happens is it over time, it becomes more of a habit. And then you start to notice things automatically that you're grateful for. Yeah, when I've you're grateful, you're, in, you're present. When you're grateful, you're present. Yeah, I've personally had uh, more success with uh, being more specific to the day, right? So like, it's, it reminds me of when I used to like do that uh, exercise where I'd walk over to a trainer and tell them what a good job that they're doing that. I could be vague and say, oh, Justin, you're such a great trainer. I just want to let you know yeah. that. Or I could say, hey, I saw how you just did this with X client. I just want to tell you that I'm super appreciative of that. Or like, that's super unique and special. Like, so pointing. So the same thing I do on myself, right? So if I'm trying to practice gratitude, I try and think of the things that I'm grateful for today or that day or yesterday, right? So if you're practicing in the morning, I'm probably thinking about my day yesterday. If it's in the evening, I'm thinking about what happened in my day. And I'm trying to think of these, these small things in the day that you take for granted that, you know, it's like, you know what, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. Like I've had, I haven't had an issue with a vehicle getting to and from work in so long. And like, I know so many people that that's a major thing. Like I'm so grateful and blessed that I'm in a position that I have this vehicle that gets me to yeah. it. It's like having very specific things that you can point out in the day. I, I've found that has been more same successful. here. Mm -hmm. Same here. Uh, if, I've lately been trying to do it twice a day. Uh, and that's, a, that's a big part of it is where I'll think about what I'm grateful for. And that happened that day because it's an easier practice that way than to be more general, like you said. You know, this this really what came from a, a coach or a trainer that was that had posted this. I think it was a coach or a trainer. Was it? A, was, yeah. you, was that that's what that it was? I believe so. And so I, I wanted to share some things, too, that I think that uh, I have found was successful for me, which was. And I think Arthur Brooks has talked about this, like one of the one of the best things that you can do when you like reach a goal or master something or get really good at something is to turn around and then teach it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so one of the most rewarding things and one of the things that keeps me going uh, it, as far as in my, in my fitness, you know, goals is a lot of what, what I, when I decide, Oh, I'm going to shift the way I train or I'm going to try a different way of eating, or I'm going to focus now on getting mobile here, or I'm going to get really good at this, this snatch or an exercise I've never done before. A lot of that motivation is the teaching part is mm -hmm. knowing that going through the process of not knowing how to do it or not liking it or not wanting to do it or have never done it before the going through the learning process of that now gives me this new perspective on how to coach and teach that to others. That's one of the most rewarding and it's one of the easiest. You also get to relive the joy by reliving it with someone else right. who now gets to also learn and go through that process. Right. It's like you get to do it again. And so that's been a massive hack yeah. for how do I get up every morning and still get after it or want to work out when I've achieved these certain things in my fitness journey that it's like, okay, what do I also, do I got to prove and I'm already fitter than the average person. So what do I do to keep me going every day? Well, a lot of that motivation for me now is that we're in a position yeah. of teaching and then we can teach others and passing that knowledge on and giving that and sharing that part of what keeps me challenging myself is that exact thing is that okay you know well i never got really proficient at the turkish get up let me get really good at this and then while i'm doing it i'm learning like oh wow this is a, a thing that really helps i should teach this and help with that and so those things have, have helped me in yeah. my journey i think it's i think at the end of the day don't think of a goal as a destination but rather as a milestone Mm -hmm. uh, that is that you're going to run into along this journey that's never going to end. So you have a goal, but it's not, that's where I'm at. This is it. This is the, this is, I'm done. It's literally, that is going to be like a, like a sign, like a road sign. Oh, I finally, I'm at this milestone. Now let's continue on until we get to the next one. And by the way, they never end. The journey never ends. And when you fall in love with that, uh, then fitness and looking good is a byproduct. Look, if you love the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free fitness guides. We have a lot. They're all free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano and Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam. 